latest event in the Stanislavski Research Center's range of activities. This is a center co-hosted by the University of Malta and the University of Leeds and co-directed by Dr. Stefan Akalina from Malta and Professor Paul Fryer, who's a visiting professor at Leeds amongst many other things and great to see them both in the call. Uh, my name is Jonathan Pitches. I'm Professor of Theatre and Performance here at Leeds, here being a virtual thing, uh, and I'm Head of the School of Performance and Cultural Industries uh, and the Deputy Director of the Stanislavski Research Centre. I'm going to speak very briefly, but before I hand over to the very capable hands of Mark Shields, who's worked extremely hard to bring such a fantastic panel together, I wanted to just put this uh, this panel in context uh, and also to apologize personally for an early exit. I have a long-standing event to chair as part of my role as head of school. This then is one of a series of webinar webinars as part of the S Word project, a key strand of the Stanislavski Research Center's program of activities. Previous events, if you haven't seen them or connected to them, uh, after the event were on Stanislavski and race, Stanislavski and disability, and Stanislavski and online learning. And I'll drop some links into the chat before I leave. If you check out the website, you'll see recordings of these webinars and links to an incredibly wide range of Stanislavski research resources. I should say, excitingly, that this is connected to a new book series edited by Paul Fryer. Um, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly named Stanislavski and, um, uh, uh, and we welcome responses and ideas from, the, from any of you for new suggestions or for book proposals, either for webinars or books in this series. This is the last event for this year, but we have two further webinars coming up. So do keep out a, a lookout uh, and ongoing discussions about how to deliver our annual S Word International Conference. Maybe Paul has some thoughts about that later. So now let me, with some pride and the deepest respect, hand over to Mark, who amongst many other things is studying for a PhD with myself and Maria Capsali at Leeds. Mark. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Hello everyone, I am Mark Shields. My pronouns are they, them. I am a postgraduate researcher at the School of Performance and Cultural Industries, University of Leeds. I want to welcome and thank you for joining us today. As the organizer and moderator, I thought it might be helpful to give a brief sense of how I approached creating this event. Stanislavski and gender have both been topics of ongoing critique within theater and performance research and practice and beyond. And at first, I admit that the title suggested a polemic that made me feel uncertain. As I mentioned in the description to the event, the prevalence of Konstantin Stanislavski's work and its influence endures across the vast field of performance, and his prominence as a male figure receives renewed debate and criticism. Stanislavski's work and the subsequent actor training methodologies that cite and acknowledge his positive influence on them are described by some feminist scholars as oppressive. Nevertheless, Stanislavski's artistic career and creative development was in close collaboration with women. And I also note the remarkable wealth of scholarship by women in Stanislavski studies to celebrate. The practicalities of organizing such an event meant that I could only invite six speakers and I was spoiled for choice. Stanislavski may provoke a sense of excitement, curiosity, reverence, nostalgia, and the warmth of familiarity. Conversely, or perhaps not, his name also may feel strange, disassociating, outdated, offensive, and even painful. He still has the power to conjure a range of responses that may not always be experienced as exclusive from each other as the facile binary that I have just described might suggest. Gender, its language and significance and function continues to proliferate. And I think it is vital in any discussion of gender to acknowledge that gender is experienced, understood and articulated differently across cultures. 
First Nation, Indigenous, Global South, Global Majority and pre-colonial cultures may not necessarily articulate gender as phenomena organized in a binary structure of male and female. More recently, an expanded view of gender has gained resonance socially and politically as people find new and diverse language to describe their experiences of gender and identity. Stanislavski, of course, was not immune to how socio-cultural and political change shaped notions of gender as his lifetime spanned Imperial Russia, Revolution and the Soviet Union, which produced new ideologies of what the Soviet man and woman should be. From Stanislavski's scholarship, we might also understand how language evolves and inflects the transmission of knowledge. A common feature globally in the discussion of gender are inequalities, and I cite Professor Kimberley Crenshaw's concept of intersectionality here. Crenshaw's concept, which identifies the multiple levels of marginalization experienced by Black women in the US criminal justice system, has gained popularity outside of its original context to aid the understanding of the nuances of marginalization, discrimination, and inequality, and what Crenshaw explains as, and I quote, the conceptual limitations of a single issue analysis. It is important to recognize the power of critique for breaking cultures of silence that enable and perpetuate harm. I also invite us to think about how the repetition of injurious experiences might not solely define the pairing of Stanislavski and gender. Returning to this potential polemic, when I approached our speakers, I expressed that I am interested in what can gender offer Stanislavski scholarship conceptually to cultivate new research, practice and perspectives. Instead, we might think of Stanislavski with gender or Stanislavski through gender rather than demarcating an unhelpful binary between the two that the use of and in the title may signify. Instead, how might this relation we are making between Stanislavski and gender intersect and inevitably fragment? And how can this dynamic be mobilized productively by each of us respectively in a variety of ways? Dr. Maria Ignateva will no longer be presenting this afternoon, unfortunately, though our five speakers have accepted and interpreted my invitation for conversation in their own way, with their own expertise and with much generosity, which I am delighted about and I thank them. Each speaker will have 10 minutes before we open for discussion between ourselves and questions from the Q&A function that Paul, uh, Professor Paul Fryer has kindly offered to moderate and he will also conclude for us. And you can also use the chat function. So I will now hand over to Professor J. Ellen Gaynor uh, from Cornell University. Thank you, Ellen. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Mark, for inviting me to be part of this today. And I hope everyone will uh, bear with me. I am going to read uh, a text just uh, because that's, uh, I think, the, the best way for me to, to get through all of this. And let me just preface this by saying that this is new research. Uh, so your questions and your thoughts uh, will be very welcome. Um, and uh, I uh, look forward to, to hearing, hearing those from you. Um, as Mark said, I'm uh, Professor Jalen Gaynor. I'm in the Department of Performing and Media Arts at Cornell University. My research centers on British and American modernist theater and women's dramaturgy, as well as gender theory and performance. Um, I have a, an article on Stanislavski and feminism uh, that appeared a number of years ago now that I think is why Mark invited me. So uh, I'm delighted to be continuing uh, this research now. I'm going to be speaking today about modernist acting on the American stage pre-1923, uh, textual evidence from Susan Glassbell's Trifles and a Jury of Her Peers. And I want to preface this also by saying that what really is spurring this work is not only these two texts, but also um, my interest in interrogating uh, a trope in the history of American acting that uh, uh, basically looks at 1923 as a pivotal moment of a significant transition. And I'm gonna talk about that during, uh, during my remarks. So we just wanna frame things that way. In January, 1917, the French modernist director Jacques Coupeau and actors uh, from his Vieux Colombier company arrived in New York for what became a two year residency. Coupeau had already been strongly influenced by Stanislavski's writings and considered him his master in Coupeau's own development as a director and teacher. During his time in New York, Coupeau documented his observations of US theater 
And these firsthand impressions, filtered as they were through Coupeau's Stanislavskian sensibility, open helpful windows onto American stage artistry of this moment, just a few years before Boleslavsky and Uspenskaya arrived in 1923 to introduce Stanislavskian techniques. Coupeau later directly positioned his contributions as precursors to those of Stanislavski. And this is Coupeau, quote, if the examples of our art that we were able to produce in New York have made an impression, if they have had some influence and so prepared the way for the great Konstantin Stanislavski, we are today happy and very proud. Now, given the dominant historical narrative that 1923 marks a revolutionary moment as completely changing the landscape of American acting, Coupeau's remarks suggests we may need a more nuanced historiography, particularly as we consider how Stanislavskian techniques initially resonated with American acting. As a case study, we might consider the performances and dramaturgy of Susan Glassbell, whose work for the American, I'm sorry, the experimental little theater company, the Provincetown Players, Coupeau admired. And for those maybe not familiar with the Provincetown Players, it was uh, one of the first of the uh, uh, American little theater companies based on European uh, alternative theater models. And it's probably best known historically for uh, starting Susan Glassbell's career as a playwright and also the playwriting of Eugene O'Neill. Now, while uh, Glassbell is remembered today primarily as a writer, I want to emphasize the synergies between her writing and her acting and explore how, if examined this way, her artistry may provide evidence of techniques that would soon resonate with those imported from Russia, especially for her female characters. In April 1917, Coupeau attended a performance of Glaspell's play, The People, in which she also performed one of the key roles. While he was critical of others in the cast, seeing in their work the need for training in the modernist style, Coupeau noted that Glaspell's acting technique touched him, quote, to the core by the simplicity of her attitude, the pure quality of her person, the inimitable feeling in a nuance of her intonation. Now, Coupeau does not speculate on how she achieved this impact technically. But I'd like to suggest that her performances were effective because she already intuited some of the psychological and uh, uh, physical underpinnings of the Stanislavskian actor's process. She was already quite familiar with uh, uh, the evolving uh, psychological research and actually had already written another play about this called Suppressed Desires. Moreover, I believe that Glassville, through her explanation of the compositional steps for her best known play from 1916, 1916 called Trifles, that play will offer us insights as relevant to her acting as to her playwriting. Indeed, shows us the important parallels between these forms of artistry. Glassville had begun her career as a journalist in Iowa. For the Des Moines Daily News, she had been assigned to cover the trial of a farmer's wife accused of murdering her husband. And that case later formed the, the basis for Trifles and its short story counterpart, a jury of her peers. As Glaspell scholar Linda Benz V observes, Glaspell's reporting and her attitude toward the accused woman underwent a significant sympathetic shift after she had been allowed to visit the farm and see for herself the barren conditions of the accused woman's life. Now, Glaspell provided us with a detailed description of how she developed this play for the Provincetown Players Company. And this is a, a little bit of a longer quote from Glaspell. I sat alone and looked for a long time at that bare little stage. After a time, the stage became a kitchen. I saw just where the stove was, the table, and the steps going upstairs. 
Then the back door opened and people all bundled up came in. Two or three men, I wasn't sure which, but sure enough about the two women who hung back, reluctant to enter that kitchen. When I was a newspaper reporter out in Iowa, I was sent to do a murder trial. And I never forgot going into that kitchen of a woman locked up in town. I had meant to do it as a short story, but the stage took it for its own. Whenever I got stuck, I would run across the street, sit in that leaning little theater until the play was ready to continue. Now, what Glaspell doesn't mention here is that in the original 1916 production, she played one of those two women and that these recollections of entering and observing the Iowa kitchen would have been resonant for her, not only as a playwright, but also as an actor. And obviously we can identify in this explanation, the acting technique variously known as effective memory or emotion memory as Hapwood tr translated it or analytic memory as it came to be known in the US after 1923 from Boleslavsky and Espenskaya. And importantly, Glaspell described this creative process as occurring to her before it was codified for American actors. One of the other remarkable gender dramaturgical elements of trifles is Glaspell's crafting of these women's speeches. Using fragmented syntax that leaves significant thoughts and feeling unspoken but nevertheless palpable, Glaspell captures the essence of subtext exactly as we understand it from Stanislavski expert Sharon Carnegie, who explains that, quote, subtext may be inferred by identifying gaps in the text, such as pauses or ambiguities in language, through which the actor imagines the unspoken thoughts that prompt the spoken lines. For example, in the dramatic moment of identification with the incarcerated far, uh, farm wife accused of murder, one of the women recalls, when I was a girl, my kitten, there was a boy took a hatchet and before my eyes and before I could get there, if they hadn't held me back, I would have hurt him. We might productively compare this fractured dramaturgy to that of another American playwright, Sophie Treadwell, who used similar syntactic patterns for the central female character in her 1928 play, Machina. Significantly, however, Treadwell deployed such dramaturgy after her intensive actor training with Boleslavsky and close involvement with the American Laboratory Theater that Boleslavsky and, and Uspenskaya started. Importantly then, these two scripts, both products of actor playwrights, give us clear evidence of techniques identified with Stanislavski, but being utilized in modernist productions both before and after their dissemination in the United States. Finally, I wanna suggest that Glaspell's short story version of the same narrative, A Jury of Her Peers, published just a year after her appearance in Trifles, can be read as a further refinement of that production's performances. Now in the fiction version, Glaspell provides details of characters' movements, gestures, motivations, and vocal delivery that we can understand as either capturing her fellow actors' work or equally possibly amending their performances to more closely reflect her own artistic vision. While these two works are usually read as related but distinct due to their generic differences, I want to suggest that they can also be read as the before and after versions of a performance text. As such, they provide a unique glimpse of modernist acting leading up to the arrival of Stanislavski's protégés. Equally important is the fact that these modernist techniques appear in a woman's writing represented through her female characters. And lastly, if indeed American actors were already developing or at least becoming aware of such modernist techniques, then perhaps we can better understand how Boleslavsky and Uspenskaya could quite quickly connect with performers seeking a more holistic and comprehensive modernist approach to acting for the American theater. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ellen. And um, we'll take questions and enter into discussion in the end, but there's, there's plenty there that I've been scribbling down. So thank you so much. Uh, so next we have Professor Peter Tate. Uh, uh, Professor Peter Tate is an academic and playwright uh, and fellow of the Australian Academy of Humanities. She has written over 60 scholarly articles and chapters and edited and authored 12 books. Uh, including the authored Forms of Emotion, Human to Non-Human in Drama, Theatre and Performance, published by Routledge, Theory for Theatre Studies, Emotion, published by Bloomsbury in 2021, the edited Great European Stage Directors, Antoine Stanislavski and Saint Denis, Volume 1, London Bloomsbury, and the co-edited Feminist Ecologies, Changing Environments in the Anthropocene, 2018, and the authored Fighting Nature, Sydney University Press, 2016. So please welcome Professor Peter Tate. Hi everyone. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, Paul. It's a fantastic opportunity to be here. So I want to begin by um, acknowledging the country that I speak from, which is Wurundjeri country of the Kulong nation here in Australia. And to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm going to now share my screen. Please excuse this particular um, version of the PowerPoint, which is to do with the fact that I'm not on my good computer because this, the internet connection is unstable. Olga Knipper and Konstantin Stanislavski acted together to acclaim in the early uh, Moscow Art Theatre productions of Chekhov's plays that established the country's, the company's reputation. When Oliver Saylor claims that the three great moments in the production of Chekhov's Three Sisters in 1903 were between Knipper and Stanislavski as Marsha and Vashinin, he attributes these moments to Stanislavski's genius. Knipper's contribution to this theatre history is far less recognised. Yet it is Knipper as Marsha and Stanislavski as Vashinin that created these moments that are clearly about emotional exchanges. She was recognised as the Moscow Art Theatre's um, leading or greatest female performer. In instances where Knipper's interpretation had to be adjusted, scholarship in English about a disagreement over the interpretation of emotions implicitly values Stanislavski's analytical approach and accepts Knipper's approach as felt, as if the acting of feeling does not also require thought. There are different kinds of thought, of course. To what extent then was a perceived divergence in their approaches due to gendered perspectives and indicative of a wider pattern in 20th century theater? So Stanislavski's system followed the advent of the pioneering James Long theory, arguing that emotional feeling involves physiological responses that happen. And I'll just see if I can move this slightly there. That, um, that physiological responses that happen prior to mental processes, that is thought. This theory initiated a kind of possibility of a separation between bodily feelings and ideas of the emotions, words for emotions, language, in their 20th century study. Now, Stanislavski perceived that physiological feeling was difficult to act and emphasized the performance of emotional expression in this direction of Knipper's female characters. And I'm quoting here from an early translation. Stanislavski writes, quote, but feelings cannot be fixed. They run through your fingers like water. It is necessary to find a, a more substantial means of affecting and establishing your emotions. 
female collaborators like Knipper need to be accorded more significance in theatre history. And now, my analysis does not set out to denigrate Stanislavski in any way because I, I value his work highly. But to question gender, gendered assertions and assumptions about working relationships and about approaches to acting emotions. So it affirms theatre as a collaborative undertaking as it highlights Knipper's approach to the early realistic acting of emotional feeling. Now, both um, Knipper and Stanislavski offer perspectives. And I'll come back to this. So they offered perspectives well in advance of approaches developed late and later in the studies of the emotions. Now, I also contend, and I'm not going to elaborate here, but I have written about this in forms of emotion. I contend that Stanislavski's concepts of experiencing an act of analysis can be aligned with the way sensations of bodily affect are being distinguished from emotional feeling in 21st century affect theory. This includes the way thought creates bodily sensation. I mentioned, you know, I did mention the quote what Sajid Javid, the health secretary, had said yesterday. We also, I mean, if Jenny Harry's talking about the numbers being staggering in the days ahead. We're hearing about an alarming briefing that. Chris Sorry, it's a bit of a crossover there. <laughs> um, and and actress thinking is also part of the embodied process. Responses expression, only some of which align with emotional expression. I certainly feel we do need to separate some of the you know, political statements we heard yesterday from uh, from from the facts. And I'm not Nesta, your microphone's on. The chief medical officer is going to. Present. Sorry, Nesta, if you could just mute your mic, that would be great. Thank you so much. Okay, I'll just repeat that. And actors, um, so it, the idea is that affect. Um, thought creates affect or bodily sensation and actors thinking is also part of the embodied process that cues responses and expression, only some of which align with emotional expression. Knipper's um, interpretation of emotions was resisted. John Benedetti reports that uh, Knipper wanted to act Marsha's confession of her love for, for Sheenan to her sisters, quote, on a, a note of high, almost desperate emotion, a pentient woman pouring out her heart, unquote. And Stanislavski felt that at this point in Act 3, her delivery should be subdued to fit into his director's plan for the emotional progression of the whole production. But was this realistic? They disagreed so vehemently that Benedetti believes that Stanislavski considered taking her out of the production. But the disagreement was resolved when um, uh, the co-founder of the Moscow Art Theatre, Vladimir um, Nemirovich Danchenko, agreed with Stanislavski and rejected Knipper's approach. And then Chekhov subsequently agreed with Nemirovich. This was not simply a disagreement over Knipper's general approach to acting emotions, and nor was it indicative of her style. It was her interpretation of a particular character's emotion in specific circumstances of a woman engaging in an extramarital affair. Marsha is confessing about a life-changing event to her sisters, who are close companions and monitor how each other is feeling. And Marsha's appeal it was emotionally, socially, and morally confronting for these female characters. And conversely, prior to this role, Knipper had found it um, uh, uh, quite difficult acting, quote, the highly strung interpretation of Elena in Chekhov's Uncle Vanya imposed on her by Stanislavski and Nemirovich. Instead, she wanted to create a more cool and impassive character. So beyond the validity of the same to create an overall tempo for a production, 
Stanislavski's interpretation of the realistic reactions of female characters was questionable. His instruction, um, uh, his instruction for Knipper as Arkadina and Chekhov's The Seagull to pace the stage with her hands behind her back when she is angry after Treplov stops his play strikes John Stein as inappropriate for an actor character accustomed to commanding attention. The bias arising from beliefs about gender difference is supported by long-standing binary values in Western culture that esteem analytical thought associated with masculinity and emotional expression is feminine and therefore coming under masculine control. To a large extent, the sequence formulated by Aristotle in which merit mental impressions, thought, facilitated emotional expression um, or emotional responses to a theatrical narrative remained historically dominant because this was how emotions were understood to happen. The sequence was thought and emotional feeling followed or mental impression and emotional feeling followed. But then in the wider philosophical context from 1884 and particularly with William James, um, however, this was significantly reversed by a sequence in which emotional feeling arises within the body prior to thought. So this development coincided with early realistic theatre. Yet the approaches of both Knipper and Stanislavski re reveal the conception of the bodily primacy of emotional feeling proves less helpful to the performing of emotions than might first appear. And this early realistic theatre offers alternative understandings of the emotions that correspond more with approaches developed in psychology in the second half of the 20th century. So in Knipper's account of her work with Stanislavski, she describes a dynamic of acting, acting her character in relation to the looks and emotional intonations of Stanislavski's character. Knipper is describing an approach to acting that is relational in that she works in response to the expressiveness of another character. Now, we know she was part of a theatre movement which rejected melodramatic 19th century acting styles of demonstrating gestures and actions that signalled emotions. And as Benedetti describes, the Moscow Art Theatre were very successful at, quote, doing nothing and representing emotions. But Knipper describes how she acts in relation to other performers through dynamic interaction. And emotions are being specifically defined as relational by the late 20th century. So the understanding that was here at this time in early realist theatre was well ahead of its um, conception elsewhere. After 1917, Stanislavski advocates an act of analysis in which physical enactment creates the circumstances in which emotional expression can emerge. Now, this is another more complicated version of relationality. And psychological studies develop appraisal theory that will, so, and this was happening from the 1960s, that argues for an expanded type of relationality in that it is a description of how emotional feeling arises through orientation to others, events and the surroundings, which provide the stimuli for emotional feeling. And this was appraisal theory developed because the James's theory was a feed that created a kind of feedback loop. So I'm arguing here that both Knipper and Stanislavski understood feeling through working in realistic theatre in, in a way that was in advance of what came later. But of course, this didn't prevent um, the 
interpretation of a female character's emotional feeling um, from being gendered. And I'll finish there and thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Fiza. That was fantastic. Um, next up, we have Dr. Baron Kelly. Um, Dr. Baron Kelly is a four time Fulbright scholar and professor of the theatre uh, in the uh, theatre and drama department at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, Baron has performed internationally for the Stratford Shakespeare Festival of Canada, the National Theatre of Norway, the Yamaleva Theatre in Moscow, Russia, the Constanz Theatre in Athens, Greece, um, Academy Theatre of Dublin, Edinburgh Fe Theatre Festival, Bargello, Florence, uh, and among others. Broadway uh, credits include uh, Salome and Electra. Numerous classical and contemporary roles for um, for over 30 of America's leading regional theatres, including the Oregon, Utah, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Southern California Shakespeare Festivals, Yale Repertory, the Guthrie, Shakespeare Theatre, Washington, among others. Uh, Dr. Kelly's work has been published in the Theatre Journal, uh, Journal of American Drama and Theatre, African American National Biography, American Theatre Stage Directors and Choreographers Journal, the Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Scholars, Publishing, Peter Lang publishes the Journal of Institute for African Studies and others. He serves as the Fulbright Review Panel, International Institute of Education at China US, the Scholars Review Panel, and the Board of the Arden Shakespeare Series, um, which is the advisory editorial board. Lagos Notes and uh, Records, um, Harold Pinter Review, the Comparative Drama Conference, Stanislavski Institute Advisory Board, the National Theatre Conference, and the American Society of, uh, for Theatre Research. In 2022, Baron will be invested as the Fellow in the College of Fellows in the American Theatre. His book, titled The Act, An Active Task, Engaging the Fences, is available from Hackett Publishing Company. He is currently under contract to Routledge Publishers for a co-edited, co-authored manuscript with Karen Kopriansky, The Embodiment of Text. So please welcome Dr. Baron Kelly. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you know, I'm just flattered to be in such distinguished company. And when you reached out to me, I didn't know if I had anything really to say about this. Uh, but um, I think, uh, well, first of all, I, I have to give credit to my late great friend, Lynn Redgrave, who gave me the courage and the impetus to do uh, what I'm going to talk about, and also in conversations with Ian McKellen. Yes, I'm name dropping, but these people were very instrumental in me putting together uh, what I've had uh, tremendous opportunity to do. Uh, this presentation is called pretty much uh, Using the Tools of Stanislavski, Finding Empathy in Uncovering Ira Aldridge, Prophet of Protest. Uh, quote, the child of the sun, black my countenance, yet I stand before you in the light of my soul. True feeling and just expression are not confined to any clime or color. These are some of the words of Ira Aldrich, who was America's first internationally acclaimed actor, born in 1807, New York. Aldridge spoke out against slavery and became the first African-American actor to achieve success on the international stage. When he was a teenager, he joined the first um, black professional company in 1820 in New York, the African Theater Company. He also at that time um, became a valet to a British actor named Henry Wallach and learned by watching Wallach and being tutored by Wallach and um, he realized at that time, certainly, that there was no opportunity for him. He had a dream of being an actor and Wallach gave him an introduction, a letter of introduction to Britain, uh, to the Coburg Theater. And in a pursuit of a dream, he traveled to England. In, um, and uh, from there for the next 44 years of his life, he traveled to throughout Europe and Russia, breaking racial barriers during a time when many of his black brethren were enslaved in New York. Between 1852 and 1867, he completed a number of successful tours to various cities in continental Europe, including St. Petersburg, Moscow, Odessa, Tallinn, Marseille, Riga, among others. During that time, 
Also, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin was being translated in Russia and Hungary, um, dealing with many issues, certainly, that uh, were in um, conversation at Russia, dealing with the freedom of the serfs at that time. Uh, as actors, our work should be about the broadest human experience. Yes, it can be narrowed into one's culture, one's sexuality, but at the core, one is still human. Uh, this is a quote from Stanislavski and uh, Stanislavski directs, quote, you must love your chosen profession because it gives you the opportunity to commute, communicate ideas that are important and necessary to your audience, unquote. During my travels in Russia and Eastern Europe, I had to go into the archives to get more to the heart of this man. If I was going to develop a one man show about him, I had to get into the letters and the newspaper clippings, what others said about him. As Ellen had said, I had to read between the lines. I call it the space between the notes to be able to create these dialogues, uh, these scenes real and imagined that happened in his life. Uh, the nature of acting, at least in part, involves the critical analysis of oneself and the internalizing of situations and feelings. I'm gonna read a little bit after I finish this sort of preamble here. Uh, the development of imaginary reality through sensory responses to imagery, senses, and feelings using kinetic, kinesthetic responses to channel particular kinesthetic responses that I personally experienced in Norway, uh, and Russia, in cemeteries, and with family of great uh, particular actors, um, in Hungary, uh, and internalizing this with particular roles that I've had a wonderful opportunity to be able to play. Um, so it was interesting for me to do this and to figure out how the character's action in this particular place, uh, Aldrich's action, was driven by his need to be able to stand on these stages and be able to speak the King's English in these particular situations and be accepted as a man. Um, so I had to use my imagination and energy and physical life to translate that need into his particular psychological human experience for the characters in my uh, performances to open my heart and act from an unprotected self, to bring my authentic self into the room. The ability to work from my unprotected self under imaginary circumstances that are imaginatively created. Truth means different things for many people. Stanislavski was after the sincerity of acting. Truth on the stage is anything we can believe in with sincerity, whether in ourselves or in our colleagues. Truth cannot be separated from belief nor belief from truth. Truth in human behavior is embedded in the action between the lines. So basically, I have co-opted Stanislavski's tools or some of them to help me in unearthing a particular history of Aldrich that could have been marginalized and in some cases it is forgotten to help me to understand me and my place in the world, using acting as a way of exploring human potential. And, you know, when I was a young actor, I was able to study with Uta Hagen and Sandy Meisner in New York. And so basically I've turned a lot of these teachings into finding a way into the truth, as, as McKellen would say. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit of, from, Cutting, as they say. I'm going to set it up. Um, Aldrich is just given a performance outside of St. Petersburg, and a rabbi fights his way through the crowd to come to Aldrich. Um, and I'll just read this in these voices because I'm not going to be able to act it on Zoom. Um, hey, excuse me, Mr. Aldrich. Please excuse me, friends. I won't keep you a moment. Please, madam, translate what I say, please. Thank you, Mr. Aldrich. I was told I could not see you. 
and I hope you will forgive this unorthodox behavior from an orthodox rabbi. I am Rabbi Itzhak ben V, a a rabbi of a small congregation just outside of St. Petersburg in Zhidonia. And so I do not wish you any harm. I'm sure you do not, Father. Are you all right? I know <laughs> this is such bad manners, Mr. Aldrich. But I represent several congregations in the Jewish community who want to thank you for your moving portrayal of Shylock. You have shown him honestly with his horns and his halo. It gives us pride and hope, Mr. Aldrich. And so I would like to present you with this scroll of David from several hundred well wishes and this specially made necklace. It is our star of David. Our homes will always be open to you, good friend. Shalom. Shalom, Father. You do me great honor. This is one of a series and I don't have enough time to do a couple of others to give um, a sense of empathy to this great man who is being acknowledged today, finally, um, and as a black man. And um, there's another scene I was going to read where the rabbi tells him that he should leave his hands unpainted, uh, unmade up um, and leave them black so that he can show who he really is underneath uh, his actor's mask. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. Uh, and next we have Barry Fitzgerald. Barry, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Thank you, Mark, um, and the whole team. Thank you so much for having me and echoing what Byron said there. Um, it's wonderful to be in such esteemed company. And also, uh, when Mark asked me at first to be part of the panel, I think we had quite a conversation where I was like, why would you ask? I don't, I don't have anything to say. So um, I guess I'll just preface that this is... <laughs> <laughs> I'll preface that this is from my own experience, as it is with everyone, as a maker, um, a performer, an acting tutor, and lots of many hats, as it is as a freelance artist. But it's very much from, uh, yeah, when I work with performers, actor training. Um, so um, my name is Barry Fitzgerald. I use he, they pronouns. I'm a white Irish person, and I have bleached blonde hair, gold piercings in both ears. I'm wearing a lavender roll neck top with a gold chain, and I'm sitting in a room with light gray walls and two bookshelves. The title of what I'm gonna speak about is called Working with the Queer Performer or Maker to Shift Perspectives on Actor Training. I'm a queer performer, maker, director, and acting teacher. The work I make is often queer focused, interdisciplinary and increasingly experimental. Alongside, I teach and direct in university and conservatoire settings, including here in London, Arts Ed, Mount View, and most regularly at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. I'm not a Stanislavski scholar, but his methods have played a big part in my creative life, from university and drama school training as an actor, to my teaching and directing work right through to my creative projects as a solo maker. In terms of my actor training, there are elements that in hindsight I find troubling, unsafe practices by teachers to mine for emotions without any sense of aftercare, or observations that either shamed or denied me the opportunity to inhabit my queerness in my acting work. And no doubt, in ways I replicated elements of these practices when I first started teaching. But there have been projects, especially in the last seven years or so, which have been transformative and instrumental in changing how I approach actor training and making in general. 
I'll be speaking about two of these projects. The first is Transacting, a collaboration between two organizations, Gendered Intelligence, a trans-led and trans-involving charity that exists to increase understandings of gender diversity and improve trans people's quality of life, and the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, one of the leading drama schools here in the UK, where I've been a visiting lecturer since 2012. In summer 2015, trans acting started as a series of masterclasses and workshops at Central with an aim to create a safe, gender inclusive space for trans, non binary, gender non conforming people where they could participate in sessions including voice, movement, text, improvisation, and audition technique. I was invited to be an acting tutor, and the project was such a success that in the years that followed, we went on to run many more workshops and we were invited to share work at festivals, including the Scottish Queer International Film Festival in Glasgow, BFI Flair in London, and Transarte in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. In recent years, Outbox, a company of LGBTIQ plus creatives, have taken on the running of transacting workshops, most recently organizing a summer school in 2019 at the Southbank Centre London. And although I still have connections with the project, uh, full disclosure, I'm an associate art artist with Outbox. I don't currently lead on it as it became important for us to support more trans practitioners in leading the sessions. But the trans acting project challenged and changed my pedagogy. Beyond pronoun circles, it highlighted the highly gendered, binary and rigid nature of many acting practices. So much of what we're searching for when we're working on a scene or exploring with a character is subjective, it's slippy and fleeting. We use language to explain or pin things down, everything from feelings to the bodies those feelings inhabit. But from whose viewpoint? When I was at drama school, I had teachers who, teachers who would consistently comment on how I needed to ground myself or how there was no point in me exploring flamboyance. I was naturally flamboyant enough. <laughs> At times, I was left feeling that my queer body had failed me once again. They had rigid views of character or how it should be played, of the world the character lived in, and I was not matching up. I believe these views, unwittingly or not, came from the heteronormative cis-centered cis perspective of most training and content. We know you can play queer. We're trying to teach you how to be versatile. The irony being that when you leave, you don't play queer. Or if you do, it's a version of queer from a normative point of view. While the accolades continue to be lauded upon non-queer actors transforming into queer characters. Following transacting, I began to use more non-gendered language, language that anybody or any body could inhabit, allowing performers to use elements of themselves in expansive and connective ways without judgment, words that came to mind like firm, soft, constrained, free. Alongside this, I found the later Stanislavski methods and the psychophysical work of practitioners like Michael Chekhov more generative and inclusive. Also movement frameworks like lab and efforts actions became useful in exploring how performers might approach work directly, indirectly, with flow or bound. It's not that I never use feminine or masculine words, far from it. But when I'm working, I began to question whether these words were the most useful for the character, but more importantly, for the performer. The second project I want to highlight is And the Rest of Me Floats by Outbox, the company of LGBTIQ creatives I mentioned before. Originally devised and performed in 2017 at the Rose Lippman Building, a brutalist community centre in East London, the show went on to be programmed as the main house show in 2019 at the Bush Theatre here in London before touring. I was part of the cast which included seven performers from across the trans, non-binary and queer communities, working with the show's director, Ben Baratta, and creative team to devise the show. The production was a mix of movement, song, stand up and dress up, autobiographical performance, experienced a queering of time, and the transitions between sections became blurrier and increasingly more central than the actual scenes. 
Elements of more traditional actor training were involved in the making, voice work, character bios, objectives. But Ben found a way for the company to have autonomy in those decisions. This shifted perspectives, allowing performers ownership in the work. It allowed for connected and nuanced performances enlivened by their own queerness, not Ben's version of it. A section of the synopsis describes the show as an anarchic celebration of gender expression and identity, playful and powerful, and the rest of me floats explores how it feels to live in a society where you are regularly categorized and policed. Do you see me? Beyond the questions, the confusion and the anger, do you really see me? These ideas around categorization extend into actor training. So much of actor training is about pinpointing where the work is needed in the performer. Your voice needs work. Your articulation needs work, your posture. But when you're looking at things from a trans or gender inclusive space, you move towards practices that celebrate qualities in the performers. And I believe that this can extend out to all performers we work with. These projects are two points on a journey that have shaped my pedagogy. To me, they highlight how we should move beyond safe spaces and inclusivity and build on the work to learn from, be led by, and meaningfully include queer trans people across all forms of actor training. We all have a relationship to gender. However, for most people, the elements of this construct are rarely considered or fully explored. The varied experience of trans and queer performers outside binary, normative perspectives can shift and expand everybody's understanding of their gender. Stanislavski and psychological realism form the core of many forms of actor training, but we must continue to question whose reality, whose viewpoint, who are the audience? How can the stories we tell and the concept of realism shift from cis, male, hetero, white, ableist, middle-class, Western-centered ideologies? Lessons on working with the queer performer or maker and creating queer inclusive spaces are just one element in how we might create a more innovative, generative and inclusive training for all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. And I had the great pleasure of being dragged on stage by Barry to dance under the confetti at the end of uh, <laughs> and the rest of your flights. So and that's, that's how we met. Um, thank you so much. Um, and next, um, last but by certainly no means least, Dr. Samir Levan. Oh, wow. Hi, everyone. Before I begin, I just want to say thank you to all the previous panelists for their interesting, thought-provoking, amazing talks. And I promise that I will endeavor to be just as engaging as they were. My name is Dr. Samia Laverne, and my preferred pronouns are she and her. I am wearing a maroon long sleeve top, a maroon turban style head wrap, big dangly earrings in the shape of Africa and red and black cat-eyed glasses. I am a brown-skinned black woman. I'm an actor, theater arts practitioner, director, and academic. I'm originally from California and moved to the UK in 2014 to pursue my postgraduate studies. I have a bachelor's and master of fine arts degree and just completed my PhD at the Royal Birmingham Conservatoire last month. My research examined the social stigma of blackness and womanhood through a comparative study of the stereotypical representations of women in the performing arts industry and the effects they have on black actresses in the UK and US. So got that out of the way, that's a little bit about me. Please don't be fooled by the title of doctor in front of my name. Although I am a newly minted academic, I am by no means a Stanislavski scholar. So for the next few minutes, I won't present to you any claims or declarations, but rather an offering. An offering of my actor training experience in the US and the UK with Stanislavski from the positionality of a black woman. The Stanislavski system, this 
Ethereal mechanism of ideology is arguably the bedrock of most modern Western acting techniques taught since the second half of the 20th century. A white man's ideals had held to be precious and near and dear to the collective hearts of actors who want to be taken seriously and considered among the best. When I challenged myself to pinpoint exactly what Stanislavski's systems or teachings were, I was at a loss. I'm a classically trained actor with a BA in theater, an MFA in acting, and just completed a PhD in performing arts. I've been in the position of the actor, the director, researcher, and on a few occasions, the teacher of this bewildering and beguiling discipline of acting. Yet somehow, I still couldn't quite put my finger on the specifics about Stanislavski that had gone into my training. Funny, isn't it? How can something that is so important to the art of acting have been so elusive and imperceptible for me? Although most Western actor training programs utilize elements of Stanislavski's system, Stanislavski the man is often dissociated from it. Actors engage with exercises and elements of the system when honing their skills while Stanislavski, the man, goes unnamed. On my bachelor's acting program, Stanislavski's An Actor Prepares was one of the required textbooks. I still have it in a box somewhere buried, stored away for safekeeping, but admittedly, I never read it. I guess I felt that in some way, just owning the book and holding it in my hands every now and then, I could absorb some useful nuggets of information through osmosis or something. I was, only, I was also only about 19 or 20 years old and the only black woman and one of a small handful of non-white actors in the theater arts department of my university. I was struggling with my confidence and agency as a woman as well as an actor. I wondered what could I possibly get from some dead white Russian guy who had no idea how restricting my marginalized intersectional status as a six foot tall plus sized black woman was in the performing arts industry. In preparation for this webinar, I had a conversation with an actor friend of mine who was also a black woman. I asked about her experience with Stanislavski in her actor training. She said, and I quote, it's a little bit like a lot of school in that it's this white guy that we hold with a certain regard. And it can feel very much like, ah, yes, the Europeans, they do everything so much better. They come up with all the innovations, end quote. This was immediately followed with a bit of a chuckle. <laughs> All jokes aside, she later went on to say, when I think of Stanislavski, I think of textbooks or books. I think of lots of lines of printed sentences on a page. I don't think of it as something vibrant or creatively inspirational. Clearly, there is a disparity here because from the research I have since done on Stanislavski in preparation for today, I discovered that in truth, Stanislavski devoted most of his life to dissecting the art of acting and creating the system as a means to unlock creativity in the actor. Bearing this in mind, what it really comes down to is pedagogy. Who is doing the teaching? How are they interpreting and disseminating the concepts, ideas, and exercises in Stanislavski's system? Furthermore, are the teachers and practitioners carefully considering the nuanced, intersectional diversity that exists within their students and adapting the system as needed to make the exercise and skill set of his system something that empowers rather than disempowers or dispossesses actors from their own artistic agency. Stanislavski's system, though rarely named, acts as an ever-present invisible force guiding actors in their creative artistry. Unfortunately, this force, 
along with the constant invisible forces of racism, discrimination, and patriarchy in my actor training experience were bearing down on me and hampered my ability to unlock my highest creative potential and thrive as an actor. Stanislavski's system in theory should provide tools for actors to access a greater wealth of creativity. Because I was being exposed to Stanislavski's system and it was never expressly identified, it did not feel like something tangible that I could possess. It was intangible because I didn't have a name for what I was being exposed to. I am only now, years later, realizing the extent to which these forces fabricated a loss of agency and onus of my true artistic creativity. At some point, usually in the beginning, when you study the fundamentals of acting, Stanislavski is mentioned, and then actors go forth learning elements of his system without them being attributed to him again. This is in stark contrast to other practitioners and techniques that we love to name drop, such as Uta Hagen, Stella Adler, Meisner Technique, and The Method. I find this phenomenon quite interesting because all of these practitioners and techniques in some way are derivations of Stanislavski and his system. In my efforts to pinpoint exactly what portions of Stanislavski's system had gone into my actor training, I realized that I had been exposed to more of it than I was aware, such as emotion memory, given circumstances, objectives, actions, the magic if, transmitting and radiating energy, just to name a few. But as I mentioned earlier, none of these had been expressly attributed to Stanislavski. In my opinion, some of these seemed obvious if one was going to play a role on stage. What actor wouldn't naturally think about the given circumstances of a character they are playing? Are some components of Stanislavski's system so obvious to me because the first of his publications was released nearly a century ago and thus has become woven into the fabric of the art of acting and therefore can no longer be separated? Maybe. Or is the system so obvious because Stanislavski didn't invent or create an acting system at all? but rather found an effective way to codify the complexities of living when presented in performance. In conversation with a friend I mentioned earlier, she said, and I quote, it's almost like he didn't invent anything. He just named and described things. He was more like a scientist. He is the discoverer in the Christopher Columbus sense of the word. Something was already there. But now that he found it and named it, he is now the discoverer of the thing. Something to consider. Now, please don't take offense with anything that I have said. Remember, this is an offering, a provocation of thoughts on Stanislavski's system from the positionality of a Black woman. Towards the end of his life, Stanislavski shared the following with his students. The system is a guide open and read. The system is a handbook, not a philosophy. The moment when the system begins to become a philosophy is its end. Examine the system at home, but forget about it when on stage. You can't play the system. There is no system. There is only nature. My lifelong concern has been how to get ever closer to the so-called system. That is to get ever closer to the nature of creativity. Hmm. Yet another interesting mental morsel to consider. So whether you adhere to the Stanislavski system or challenge it as actors, as artists, may we all continue to get ever closer to the nature of creativity and manifest endless possibilities of our artistry in fascinating and unexpected ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samia. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm just going to offer a provocation between the panel before we open up to wider questions. I, I, re I realise there's one that's already been posted in the chat. Um, but what seems to me rather organically 
um, between us is this concept of relationality that I think has an ebb and flow between each respective speaker's presentations today. Um, I think Ellen's discussion of Glassball's discipline as both a, a journalist, writer and actor, um, she's able to unsettle this common problematic tripartite of the actor, director, playwright that is so often male. Um, and I think Lauren Love talks about that being locking females into a negative ontology where the the, the actor, uh, the director and playwright so often male and the female actor. So there's for me an, an understanding of relationality between those dynamics that through Glassball's discipline, she's able to kind of unsettle and perhaps present a different perspective. Um, and I, listening to Peter's talk as well on the, 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 the different perspectives taken on emotion and reading further in her work, um, there are levels of relationality I feel that, that are on a technical level, on an epistemic level, on a social level, on a political level that, um, that I think when we look at Olga Nippers and Stanislavski's relationship becomes much more tangible to understand. It seems to be crystallised in that relationship. And I think it's, it's really striking when you read more about Olga Nippers development as an actor and what she was able to offer, you can see those correspondences to Stanislavski's own creative development, you know, particularly in a month in the country and his sort of experimental turn um, and her response to that. And Baron too, talking about an empathetic relation and developing and training an empathetic relation. Um, and, and we see this remarkable um, relationship that's developed from Barrett's performance of the rabbi and Ira Aldridge that is kind of transcends the temporality, I think, um, which is very interesting. Um, and Barry's work is of great interest to me as, as a queer person um, and how, how the queer body can shift perspectives um, when in space, our, our mere presence can shift perspectives and um, Barry used the phrase a normative point of view. And I'm interested in this, this idea between attachments, relations and perspectives um, and, and how those are not necessarily uh, predetermined and are, are often fluid. Um, and and Sami, uh, talk, talking through your experience, the, the relation to the, the text of, of an act of repairs, um, which is so often disparagingly called an act of dispairs, um, and which, you know, is written as a student diary to provoke this kind of vicarious reading of a relation with the self, that the actor identifies with themselves through the reading. When actors work with Sami, I'm looking at through my own research. Um, and also relations between the teacher and the student who is doing the teaching. Um, so I offer this kind of uh, gen genitor theme that is coming out of everybody um, today about relationality and, and different types of relations. And I wanted to know anybody else have any thoughts on that. Um, Mark, thanks. That was very interesting summation and, and linking everything together. And thank you, everyone. That they were fantastic um, presentations. I I suppose I'd have to say that what really emerges from hearing other people speaking about this is this idea of relationality to Stanislavski, of course, but. The Stanis, we've each got a different Stanislavski we're dealing with here. So it's an indirect Stanislavski. It's not perhaps a historical fizzy figure. It's, um, you know, Sami is really talking about some kind of mythic legend that haunts actor training. And Baron's talking about how, I think, in a practical way, when you're confronted with, and I, this is my experience in, as a young actor, when you're confronted with something that seems so huge and difficult, it was Stanislavski that allowed you to break down what you were doing into manageable steps. And then when you progressed a little bit more, you understood he was saying, 
but if it doesn't work, try it again, experiment, 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 you know, keep going. And I think hopefully from what, say, Barry was saying, that um, eventually it's a way you can even break down um, these fixed categories of identity and still keep Stanislavski in the frame. Anyway, I don't know. That's my immediate response. <laughs> Ellen, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. This was absolutely fascinating and, and fabulous. You know, I'm, I'm focusing on uh, this notion of, of pedagogy, right? Which um, uh, certainly in, you know, my, my own work, uh, the article I wrote now a long, a long time ago, you know, one of the things I emphasize in there is the importance of the disaggregation of the core elements of the techniques themselves from their application. And I think, you know, Barry, you, all, all, you Baron, uh, uh, Samia, all kind of articulated that in different ways, how those pedagogies um, uh, shape uh, for better or for, for worse in many cases, right? What we understand as, as the technique. And I think my my response, my thought uh, back to you, my question back to you is on a very pragmatic level, what having recognized these issues, right? Not only how theorists uh, initially did not disaggregate those things, right? The initial, for example, feminist rejection of Stanislavski, I would say is more a rejection of the uh, the interweaving of the technique from application, whether that be in a theatrical performative context or in a pedagogical context. And so what I'm wondering uh, if we can do, um, and I've been asking this for, you know, for a long time, and, and um, uh, I think folks are, you know, beginning uh, to, to, to think about this, what can we do pragmatically, pedagogically, to retain the elements of the technique that are of value, that are useful in a broad, diverse way, um, and, and move those forward, uh, apply those to this wider range of, of actors in different kinds of performative contexts um, so that we can break out of right, this really, really problematic loggerhead of uh, you know, white, male, hetero interpretations and applications, again, particularly in the acting studio. So I just want to put that out there as sort of a, a plea um, and, and a question, right? What can we do? And um, before I go to anyone else, I'm just going to, Barry, I noticed you just popped your hand out. Um, I'm going to just selfishly interject because I think the surfacing of relationality is really, really important um, for your, your question, your provocation, Ellen, because the system itself is a relational concept, right? You, you can't have given circumstances without the if, without the uh, emotion memory, without tempo rhythm, without physical action. So immediately within, within the, the technique itself, there is a relationality that is present that these two exist in order to facilitate what it is supposed to do. Um, and I think we can kind of scale that up and we can understand then the system's relation to its political, social, cultural context historically with Stanislavski, and then surface and narrate our own relationship to that through our own pedagogy that I think then gives students permission to develop a sense of their own relationality to the work. That's, that's something that I'm very interested in. Um, in that we're not imposing it wholesale uncritically um, that through our teaching and through the, the critical reflection that, that the system does foster, I think, um, we, we understand this notion of relationality um, for, as an ethical endeavor, perhaps. Barry, I wonder what you have to say. It was just um, going back to, I suppose, what, what can we do? Um, I don't definitely don't have all the answers or anything like that but I just think about in my experience either training or being involved um, training students that it strikes me that everything is very linear and if it starts with 
either you know maybe classical Shakespeare or something but then they will go to realism and build from there so at the very basis we're starting from here and we're experimenting onwards and I think you know one thing and I'm sure this does happen is perhaps it does people may, may be able to talk about it is to give equal weighting to things that might be even experimental and not so across and um and um you know have, have been given accolades and, and trialed and we know these work maybe we could give waiting to things that might not work and we're just trialing here and that could be the first thing the students encounter that they have some agency in making these processes because you know the toolbox it, it is a toolbox isn't it if it doesn't work try something else and that takes a while for you to understand there's not one way and I just see students get so frustrated because they're not getting what this framework is or whatever and it really doesn't matter as long as the audience get it right I think so yeah I wonder if we can kind of give equal weighting to other practitioners and maybe not be so linear in the way that we learn. I, I think that's a, a Stanislavski in spirit he, he was experimental he was a, a researcher um, you know he, he and there are certain tensions within that as Peter's research shows you know experimenting with more uh, spiritual approaches and all the nippers kind of response to that. But Paul, yeah, you have your hand up. It's actually not on my behalf. I just wanted to introduce a question from um, one of our participants today. Martin, hi, I think you're talking to us from Canada, if my memory serves. It's been a while since we saw each other. Um, maybe you'd like to ask your question yourself, because I think it's very appropriate to the, the current thread of this discussion. Uh, oh, hi, 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 Paul. Um, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Yes, I'm in Toronto, Canada. And um, uh, my, my question, uh, which I and I uh, addressed um, uh, Barry and, uh, and Samia, but really it's absolutely an open question to the wonderful panel of participants um, assembled here is is is, is about ap actual application of some of the fundamental language and techniques, you know, as we kind of universally have uh, come to know them uh, of what, uh, you know, we call the system and how, how those techniques can be generatively applied to um, uh, trans uh, acting students male to female, female to male, uh, which strikes me as slightly different than um, queer bodies or gender queer identities or, or fluid identities. Um, there's clearly a, a subjective individual commitment to transition to a, a, um, a, a gendered um, uh, subjectivity. And I ask only because I, I, I do teach acting and acting through song at a an honors BA music theater program here in Toronto. And I have had two students over the last couple of years uh, who were uh, fully uh, male to female or female to male um, um, individuals. And I, they did not self identify to me that way at the time. I have since learned that from them and, and have had some conversations with them. But at the time I found myself as an instructor in the room making all kinds of assumptions, I think, uh, that I'm now really challenging myself in terms of basic things like effective or analytical memory or given circumstances, states of being uh, and, and the kind of uh, gendered assumptions that were so embedded in um, uh, the language and historiography of using the system. Uh, and, and so I am very curious about how some of these basic ideas are applied to individuals who have not had a continuous performative experience as one gender or another through their uh, lifetime. So I'm very intrigued by it. Uh, I, I, I certainly was at a point of surprise, you know, a half year ago and some amount of embarrassment, I have to say, for me, in terms of assumptions that I had made about these individuals in terms of referring to um, um, their experience of gender and, and how that 
uh, uh, activated itself in the learning and the work. So there you go. There's a little loquacious uh, <laughs> extension of my of my basic question to to to, to all. Thanks. Put you on the spot, Barry, but did you have a response to that? I, oh, I saw another hand up. I wondered if. Um, whew. <laughs> it's a big question, isn't it? And um, it's certainly something I've thought a, lo a lot about. I do not have all the answers. I think for me, there are two things probably, which has been spoken about a lot. It's the, the culture, the environment that we're teaching in, just the very, very, um, you know, having um, a, a trans practitioner leading the session, then those nuanced kind of that language will, will, will um, pose different meanings just in the very body that it's coming from. Um, and, and, you know, so it's not just about the performers. It's not just about, it needs to, like all intersectionality come from all angles. Um, so that's one thing. But also I think it's about just un understanding gender in itself and that it's, it is not, even though we use it like this binary thing so um, I don't know those students but perhaps you know this idea of transitioning from one side to the other it, it, it's not that um, simple actually There's a, we need to understand that um, transness is a, and gender fluidity is, is a really complex and varied thing and sometimes I think from um, our point of view, we can just kind of think that uh, people are one thing or the other, or there's one experience of transness. So yeah, I think it's those two things. It's the culture and who and what we're studying and giving that weight, but also just our own understanding of what um, gender and, and speaking about, you know, uh, trans identity, what identity, what that is. And it's so varied, actually. I don't know if that's in any way answered. Ellen, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, you know, from a, a, a theoretical standpoint, right, we could immediately go to something like Judith Butler and the notion of gender as a performance, right? Um, but tying in, Martin, specifically to, to a word you used, culture, right? I feel like we need to help our students become aware of how the culture imposes such incredibly strict and restrictive ideas about gender. And that has implications for vocality. It has implications for physicality. The choices that I think our trans students are making as they develop uh, a new uh, identity, a new way of being in the world, um, may be so informed by these cultural tropes that are themselves reflective of these incredibly old uh, restrictive ideas, right? So I would suggest that as we're working, particularly with our, our actors who are either in the midst of a transition or are still developing that new identity, that we help them to see the panoply of options that they can employ rather than the uh, uh, ideas that they must behave a certain way in order to be considered whatever it is that they want to be considered, right? Um, and I just think that recognition, that sense that you have choices, you have different ways of being true to yourself and the identity that you have uh, emerged into, I think can be very powerful. Um, you know, in terms of uh, specific technique, I'm thinking particularly about how we work with uh, vocal performers um, who are undergoing transition and the fact that we have to be really, really sensitive to literally how the voice is changing, um, how you move from a former vocal position as a singer into or speaker into a new voice right and to and to help them expand that rage on a physiological level but also on a, a more psychological level right so that they can find literally a place for their voice to be that feels authentic and doesn't feel like an identity has been imposed upon it in order now to be considered, you know, truthful to who they are, right? That that truth has to emerge from themselves. So that's my thought. 
Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, I think it's for me, and referring to your previous comment too, it's a pedagogical question. And I think as, you know, we are not Stanislavski. I, you know, I describe my relationship to Stanislavski as non-monogamous. I'm not his PR person. Um, and so, you know, if we want to think about how, um, how emotion is understood or played out or within the context of the work, you know, bring in Peter's research and, and start a conversation with this relationship between Stanislavski and Olga and invite the voices in so that they have like a tangible example from the work. I mean, I think a lot of what I've learned about I learned about my own pedagogy or how to do research is from the complexities and problems in Stanislavski's scholarship and work, you know, the, 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 the changing of the language um, and, and that sort of thing. So I, I think he, it, it is a pedagogical question and I think it's also about pedagogical accountability, right? You know, and like Stanislavski wasn't a trained teacher as we might understand that now. Um, so yeah, I wondered if anybody else any thoughts on that. I wanted to uh, just uh... I'd go back to the with the panoply of choices that uh, you know that uh, Ellen was talking about. I, from from a, a practical experience for me, I've had been blessed to have many experiences working with prison populations. I'm part of something called the Shakespeare Behind Bars Prison Project, and I've worked with many uh, transgender folks. Uh, um, in these situations. And I can tell you that the atmosphere that I've created in uh, these particular shows or these particular rehearsal processes of seeing the dynamic of all of these particular people in a room. And the most important thing is the human core and the human connection because we all are human. And Sharon Carnegie and I, you're on the, Sharon's on this right now and Sharon and I were texting and um, it is about the human core, but how do you get to that with, and, 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 and totally, you know, get rid of all the other stuff that's out there. And I've seen what happens when these particular people are in a situation where they're enclosed and they have time to think and they have time to be in a room for three or four hours at a clip and be involved in the creative process is very, very healing, very healing. Um, and I, I've, been, I've been privy to that. And uh, I just wanted to just, just piggyback on that, that the panoply of choices that can be out there and available to people are very healing in certain aspects. And uh, we get blessed from seeing those changes, you know? That's, that's all I just wanted to just... Thank you, Baron. First hand. I think also, Martin, like in response to your question, you know, I'll speak to them as talk to them and then and, and engage in a dialogue. And I think again, we we have this notion of Stanislavski of, you know, whether it comes from the um the director's books that he used to produce and impose on his actors or whatever. But when you read the, the text of an actor pairs or an actor's work, depending on what you're looking at, you know, the, the elder figure of Tortsov is not scared of dialogue with the students. We might want to get into the kind of the end result of those dynamics, and I understand that it's fictionalized, but um, so we'll talk to the students and, and, and that I think creating an atmosphere kind of like what Baron's describing of, of reflection and discussion where that was welcomed. Um, and also acknowledging that not one trans person's experience is the same as everybody else's, that we're, we're not a homogenized group. Um, and so I think Rosemary Malek talks about in her chapter on Stanislavski and women in the Stanislavski Routledge Companion, you know, a multitude of perspectives is our, you know, it's a fantastic resource to have in a classroom, particularly the acting classroom. Barry, you have your hand up. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, uh... Just um, going off what you said there, uh, thinking about the most successful um, interactions I've had is when, uh, when the 
um, subject of gender is already in the room. And so I would kind of pose, um, what would it be like for the cis white male actors to discuss gender in that way and understand that their relationship to gender is at play as well. And it's so it's not just this reactive, we've got some trans actors, we need to think about gender, that that's already at the basis of everything so that people can move towards that and already feel that that's in the room. Will you have your hand up and then Sharon? Hi, I was just um, drawing attention to the fact that Sharon was trying to attract our attention. So I'm, I'm going to pass directly to her. Hi, Sharon, how are you? I'm so sorry. Um, it's like I got up at 4.30 to come here um, because I knew so many of you who were speaking and I really wanted to be here to hear the conversation. Um, and so I'm a little bit foggy and I was having trouble finding my hand on the new Zoom. I've been on sabbatical working on a book that I just finished. And so I'm out of practice with Zoom after teaching for a year on it. So forgive me for that. Thank you, Paul, for helping. Um, I don't know if what I want to say is going to be very articulate, given the fact that I'm still a bit foggy. Um, but first of all, I want to thank everybody for uh, for speaking, um, because um, many of you, of course, are people that I connect with. Ellen, I remember when we were first um, working on that article that you talked about in theater topics, which was so important to me came out of a conference something like this. Um, I think what I would add um, maybe in kind of a representative of Masha who was supposed to be here, that there is a huge and important group of women who were very instrumental in creating the Stanislavski work that we know. My, my recent research has been primarily on one of them, Maria Knebel, who probably became the most important voice after Stanislavski's death. And through the end of the 20th century, she taught three, three generations of directors who reshaped the Russian theater post Stalin. So um, I, I, I feel, you know, a, a little sad that we can't bring their names into it. So I'm just going to nod. On the second point, um, I want to connect if I can. Let's see if I can do this articulately without messing up or, or, or tripping on my own words. But um, Samia, is that your name? May I call you that? Because we don't know each other. Um, you spoke um, so much of what I want my own students to learn and my frustration as being someone who works in Stanislavski and with Stanislavski because so many people don't have a clue as to what he actually did in a classroom and how experimental he was. And I will just say by, you know, by point of fact for this particular um, session that in 1937, he cast a 19 year old woman to play the role of Hamlet because that woman came to him and said, I want to do it. And he said, fine, that will be your, your university. And that kind of open thinking toward gender and toward the fact that times change is something that we need if we want to ever keep his name or his experimentation about creativity. Samia, when you said he didn't invent anything, that's what he said. He said he looked at what actors did and tried to codify it and systematize it in such a way that we could talk about it. So um, I really um, feel that this kind of conversation is really important. Um, it's important to ground it in some of the history, although acting classes tend to work with practice and not history. Um, so I, I don't know if that is um, a valuable contribution um, or commentary to all your wonderful talks, um, but 
I really, um, I, I will end by saying one thing, if I might. When I very first started working with the research on Stanislavski that led first to a talk at Berkeley that then became uh, Stanislavski in Focus, that then became the second edition, which is wildly different than the first edition, because it, the second edition came after the fall of the Soviet Union, when all these archives were opened and we knew things that had been hidden, that had never uh, seen the light of day prior to 1991 about what he actually did and what he actually thought and what he was actually doing. Um, um, on a man who was um, a then Stanislavski scholar came to me when I asked him about doing this work and he said, you know, at the end of my life, I'm really frustrated. I'm so sorry that I ever started to, to study Stanislavski. I would recommend that you just get off the subject because no matter how much I've worked to clear the record, no, nobody listens. And, um, you know, in some sense, he was right because there's so much information out there that um, acting teachers don't tap especially stuff that came out after the fall of the Soviet Union, where a lot of what was repressed about his interest in non-realism, about his experimentation, about his casting of Irina Razanova, all of that had been hidden from us. But we're all somehow still stuck in the 60s and in the 50s when the method um, distorted, quite frankly, so much of what he thought about and did and worked with. And if we can't get beyond the 50s, we won't be able to see, in my opinion, why um, he is still valuable to us as actors, no matter what our genders, our identifications, what, what in it can we take to express the art that we want to make for ourselves for this century? What are those tools of creativity that we can adapt? Um, so uh, I hope I hope I've made some sense because I feel like I need another cup of coffee and I didn't want to go and make it. Um, so um, thank you all for being here and talking about it and letting me say a couple of words here. Thank, thank you, you so much, Sharon. Thank you, Samia. Uh, yes, Sharon, you may call me Samia. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think. Thank you for everything that you just said. I think the problem is, at least in my experience, a lot of times, um, you know, the way that T Stan Skolsky is taught, first of all, never named, it's just these things, but it's also taught as this is the baseline, this is the foundation, you know, like you're going to learn the language of acting, you know, these are the ABCs. And, um, you know, when you're, particularly when you're a young actor, you know, you don't want to read these books about things, you want to do stuff. And so I was, you know, and because I didn't have a name for what I was being exposed to, because they never said, oh, okay, well, this is one person's idea um, that actually he drew from lots of different things across the world and a lot of different practices, then you never know. And as a black woman who is always feeling this force of, you know, look at this wonderful white man who did this thing and in every aspect of my learning, there's this resistance that sort of comes up, especially if there's something that doesn't resonate with me. Um, and then I get looked at like a weirdo in class and no one ever says, okay, this is one way that you can go about it. This is one way that you can be exposed to it. But if it doesn't resonate with you, that's okay. You've learned through this exercise today that this is something that doesn't work and that's just as valuable because now we can look at other practitioners, other exercises and find things that do work. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen enough in classrooms. There's a lot of, uh, you say if you're stuck in the 60s and I'm not trying to come for <coughs> any practitioners that um, have been doing their job for a while, I think we are in a position where we all need to be more open-minded and just because you've been doing something for X amount of years, doesn't mean you have it figured out. Nobody's perfect, especially in this industry 
I think it's helpful for us all to remember whether we're the teacher or the student that we are always both the teacher and the student. And if we can put ourselves in the position where we're willing to learn and accept something that might be a little bit different from what we have always thought that that's a good thing and we can figure it out together. I think teachers, you know, especially in drama schools, like, hey, I've been here for this amount of years, you know, I'm trying to keep my job and it's going to take a lot for me to grasp on all these new ideas because that's not what I was taught. But just because it wasn't what you were taught, you know, um, that's okay. You know, our students don't have to suffer <laughs> in some ways as much as they did. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's about breaking that down and, and becoming a lot more collaborative in every aspect. Uh, with with the acting and the educational and the professional side. Yeah. yeah. You're exactly right, Samia. I'm uh, Samia, I'm with you absolutely on all of those points. Um, there's a flexibility in our acting classes that um, is problematic at times. Mm -hmm. A lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> you said use like flexibility. I just I thinking about a lot of the acting classes that I've had there's only been well and it's interesting i've seen it for me as the person you know who doesn't look like everybody else there's been more flexibility for the white actors but for me it's been a bit more rigid because when people look at me there's been this assumption of how i should be or how i should act and if i didn't fit in with that then I guess they just couldn't reconcile it. So for me, it always felt like I was trying to be shoved into certain boxes and I didn't feel that I was able to be free and really discover who I was. And as I mentioned in my talk, I'm just now realizing, oh, actually it was stifling my creativity. It was hampering me as an artist. Um, and it wasn't until I took a summer acting, uh, five week acting program at the Black Arts Institute in New York in 2019 first time that I ever worked with instructors that were not white, you know, they were all black, all the students were black. I was finally getting a chance to work with works written by black playwrights. And it literally changed my life because for once I didn't feel these extra forces. I could just be me and figure out what I could discover. And I grew so much within five weeks with my artistry and I was shocked because I was like, I spent years, you know, in acting programs and how is it, I'm going more in weeks, but I think it's because of that, it was that flexibility and working together. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Samia. I'm aware of time. I've got about 10 minutes left and there are a couple of comments in the chat. There's one, Samia, directly for you from Charles. I don't know if you're able to respond to it in the chat. Um, Paula suggested we wrap up shortly, but Peter, you have your hand up too. Um, I just wanted to say that um, a lot of these discussions have been happening in Australia for some time, but there is, and I want to follow on from something that Sharon said and links to what Samir is saying. Um, I learnt acting way back. I learnt Stanislavski's techniques from a female teacher. Now, there was some value in the way it came to me through, and the teacher is Zeke and Nesta, it came to me in that form. And I think we um, can get, it, it is in an essence knowledge, and knowledge can come to us in um, various kind of um, disembodied ways, but having it, having it, overcoming the kind of issue of it being male knowledge, for someone like myself who was feminist, um, it was being taught through interpretation by a female teacher made a big difference. So there's a more complex story going on here, I think, about who embodies the knowledge and how it's passed on. I'll stop there, but thank you, everyone. It's been so stimulating, very exciting. Thank you so much, Peter. Paul, I don't know if you wanted to wrap up for us. Yes, Mark, thank you very much indeed. Um, I obviously want to start by thanking our panel members today for their tremendous contribution to this event and for sharing their scholarship and their insight. And I also want to thank Steve Ansel and our, college, uh, our colleagues from the University of Leeds for their technical hosting of the event, which has been great. Thank you. 
But I also particularly want to say thank you to Mark Shields, our moderator, for the huge amount of work that's gone into planning and presenting the webinar. Yeah, anybody who's ever attempted to do one of these events before just knows how big that challenge is. So thank you very much, Mark. And of course, I want to thank everybody who's joined us today. We really genuinely have covered the world. Uh, we've had people from not quite all corners of the planet, but certainly both sides of it, um, in spite of the time differences. So thank you very much for getting up in the middle of the night or very early hours of the morning to join us. It's greatly appreciated. And it's lovely to see so many familiar faces joining us again. We hope that you found this to be stimulating and provocative. And I hope that you are now sitting there thinking, so what happens next? And today, of course, is only a starting point as these webinars ever are. Uh, Ellen said in her introduction, this is new research. The presentations that you've heard and the questions and the discussions, they've opened up very important debates and what happens to that debate now genuinely does depend on all of you. Jonathan mentioned is in his introduction at the beginning, we're developing a new book series with Routledge, which will explore Stanislavski's work and legacy very specifically within a contemporary context. And today's topic, Stanislavski and Gender, will certainly be one of the first titles in this new series. But in the meantime, if you have ideas about ways that you would like to take the debate forward, or indeed topics that you'd like us to explore in our webinar series, then please do get in touch with us because we're always very pleased to hear from you. And this is our last event, obviously, before the break. Um, we will be continuing our webinar series in the new year, and we hope to see you all again then. So can I just wish you a safe and a joyous and a peaceful holiday season? And I look forward to seeing you all again in 2022. And I'm going to hand back to Mark for any final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. I, I wholeheartedly agree that is, is what do we do next? And very much with the emphasis on the accountability of of us um, and those that are living and working and are in the rooms doing the work. I think we, we have to take up that challenge ourselves. Um, thank you to Paul Fryer, um, who has been an enormous support throughout this whole process and to all of the speakers and indeed the audience who have been absolutely fantastic. Um, and there are a couple of questions still in the chat. I don't know if the panelists could direct message um, some of those offerings um, and get in contact with those directly. I'm sorry, we haven't had been able to pick up everything. Um, Yashin, I can absolutely pick that up with you directly um, as my close colleague. Um, uh, and yes, thank you.